So Eustitia, the fiery, ambitious queen of night, is drawn towards the idealist Prince Charming of Egdon and they get married. Do they live happily ever after? Hardy takes us through the fourth book to show us how their April home of happiness soon in autumn becomes. I am Monami Mukherjee and you are watching this series on Thomas Hardy's The Return of the Native only on Nibble Pop. Welcome everyone. If we are to follow the pattern of tragedy or tragic pyramid, we would consider the fourth book as the place where the action begins to fall or you can see the denouma starts. Technically, this is also the point where we see peripety or reversal of expectations. Whose expectations? What expectations? We will see how expectations keep on being struck by disappointment, be it Eustatia's, be it Klim's or even his mother's. So through these chapters, we will see how each and every character has their expectations crushed down and how that leads to the final part of the story. We begin at the beginning in the very first chapter, which is called the re-encounter by the pool. First, there's a description of Glim and Eustatia's household just after they get married. They get still down at Alderworth and it's a little bit uh, in East Egdon. And if possible, I'll be giving you uh, the map of Egdon so that you can have a reference point of whose house is where. And so this Alderworth cottage, this is a bit far from Bloom's End, which is Klim's uh, ancestral house. And it is pretty secluded. So they have uh, a lot of time that they can spend with each other without being disturbed by anybody, which is kind of an extended honeymoon, we can say. Clem and Eustatia in their little house at Alderworth beyond East Egdon were living on with a monotony which was delightful to them. The heat and changes of weather were quite blotted out from their eyes for the present. They were enclosed in a sort of luminous mist. This happens, you know, you get married with the person you love and then this whole world vanishes and you just concentrate on each other. This is a very beautiful moment in their lives. When it rained, they were charmed because they could remain indoors together all day with such a show of reason. When it was fine, they were charmed because they could sit together on the hills. So no matter what happened, they enjoyed each other's company. They were like those double stars which would revolve round and round each other and from a distance appear to be one. Now, this is a kind of harmony uh, which we all expect from a good marriage. And somehow this kind of a beginning has a promise of a lasting relationship. Unless it's Eustatia we are talking about. So we soon come to the next part where we see that Eustatia starts to feel agitated and even troubled by a feeling that she is kind of stuck here. And Klim is uh, making no uh, effort to leave Egden Heath. He's rather concentrating on his studies so that he can go ahead with his plan of opening a school in Egden. Her anxiety reached a high pitch, but there was something in Klim's undeviating manner which made her hesitate before sounding him on the subject. So she wanted to talk about uh, going away from Egden, especially going to Paris, but the way Klim uh, carried himself, his plans, uh, Eustatia could not uh, somehow bring the topic up that easily. At this point in their experience, an incident helped her. It occurred one evening about six weeks after their union and arose entirely out of the unconscious misapplication of when of the 50 guineas intended for Eubright. Now you remember that part where uh, some money was sent by Mrs. Eubright uh, for her son as well as for Thomasine through Christian Cantle and that money eventually fell into the hands of Thomasine Eubright uh, out of which Klim's share was not yet delivered. All right. Now after receiving that money Thomasine had given a thank you note to her aunt which Mrs. Eubright received gladly 
Then she started to think, why has my son not written back? Like he also must have got the guineas. So why has he not written back? It was during this time that she came to know from Christian Cantle that all the money was actually taken away by Wildiv. Christian did not know that Wildiv had lost the money again to Diggory Vin. He thought that Thomasin's husband had all the money, so Thomasin must have received it from him. And Mrs. Yobred thought that maybe Wildiv had given Klim's share to Eustacia. So she wanted to inquire straight away from her daughter-in-law and when she heard that Eustacia was visiting her grandfather's house at Mistover, she decided to uh, go and meet her there. All right. So after she reaches uh, Mistover Nap, uh, she starts speaking to Eustacia. I was coming to see you, she said. Indeed. I did not at all expect you. Of course, Eustacia was not expecting Mrs. Yobright there. I hope you have not forgotten that Mrs. Yobright did not even attend Klim's wedding because she was so much against Eustacia as a daughter-in-law. She didn't accept her. I was coming on business only. Will you excuse my asking this? Have you received a gift from Thomasin's husband? Now, that is a pretty straightforward question. Uh, it wouldn't have sounded that rude. Uh, had there been no relationship between Eustacia and Wildiv before her marriage. Now, because there was something fishy between them, Eustacia took this as a very offensive question that you're trying to say that I'm receiving gifts from Wildiv. A gift? I mean money. What? I, myself? Well, I meant yourself, uh, privately. She's getting worse now. Though I was not going to put it that way. Money from Mr. Wildeef? No, never. Madam, what do you mean by that? Now, Eustacia is very proud too. And she has this huge self-respect out of which she's really getting hurt by the uh, suggestion that a man can give her private gifts or rather money without the knowledge of her husband. I simply ask the question. I have been... You ought to have better opinions of me. I feared you were against me from the first, exclaimed Eustacia. No, I was simply for Klim. It is the instinct of everyone to look after their own. Now, the more Mrs. Eobright is explaining, the worse the situation is becoming. You know, she's trying to explain that I wanted the best for my son. And the moment she says that, of course, it means that Eustacia is not a good choice, which infuriates her further instead of, uh, you know, cooling things down. How can you imply that he required guarding against me? I have not injured him by marrying him. What sin have I done that you should think so ill of me? Now, this is also true to some extent that, okay, Eustacia had a kind of a dubious affair with Wildiv, but other than that, Mrs. Yobright was in general so much against her. And that fixity of hatred, of disregard, was a reason why Clem and Eustacia uh, kind of went away from her so much. She didn't make an effort to accept her in the very beginning. This was something uh, which mattered at the end, I guess. You had no right to speak against me to him when I have never wronged you. I only did what was fair under the circumstances. It was condescension, nevertheless. And if I had known then what I know now, that I should be living in this wild heat a month after my marriage, I, I should have thought twice before agreeing. Now, Eustacia is also uh, giving off a lot of steam and she's trying to tell her that, see, uh, Klim has not lost anything by marrying me. I have rather lost my dreams. So this is a, a heated conversation between the two. 
and then finally eustachia is very emotional here i understand you you think me capable of every bad thing who can be worse than a wife who encourages a lover and poisons her husband's mind against his relative so you are trying to say that i encourage a lover i'm having an extramarital affair and i'm poisoning my husband's mind against his mother yet that is now the character given to me will you not come and drag him out of my hands now this has now become a very bitter game between the two who is going to win klim who is going to own klim as if klim is a property here mrs yobright gave back heat for heat don't rage at me madam it ill becomes your beauty and i'm not worth the injury you may do it on my account i assure you i am only a poor old woman who has lost a son see the idea of losing your son the idea of losing your husband as if uh, this man has no will of his own it is only the actions of the women in his life that his fate is determined if you had treated me honorably you would have had him still so this is how it goes on it's like the archetypal drama uh, of possessing the son Uh, that that is being reenacted here and then we come to the second chapter where we actually go and get to see klim and what's happening to him now klim is of course very curious about what's wrong with eustacia why is she looking different what is the matter eustacia i have seen your mother and i will never see her again a weight fell like a stone upon klim klim was planning to somehow uh, attempt a reconciliation to go to his mother with eustacia to somehow try and see if things can be made better and now he hears of this encounter between the two which has kind of sealed the deal and they can't get any closer anymore so he asks that what happened what do i know about mr wildeve now i won't have wicked opinions passed on me by anybody oh it was too humiliating to be asked if i had received any money from him or encouraged him or something of the sort i don't exactly know what so she is clearly upset because definitely wildeve has not given her any money and to be charged like this with a false accusation anybody would feel bad Klim is thoroughly confused that it must have been some some misunderstanding. I would rather not say it may have been the fault of the circumstances which were awkward at the very least. Oh, Klim, I cannot help expressing it. This is an unpleasant position that you have placed me in, and she is trying to cash in this situation. She is trying to get something out of this, some profit out of this encounter. She is trying to see if uh, this. can be converted into something she wants to happen but you must improve it yes say you will for i hate it all now yes take me to paris and go on with your old occupation claim i don't mind how humbly we lived there at first if it can only be paris and not egdon heath so see now even your relatives are being so rude and bad and i really need to escape this place and since it's your relatives who are making it worse for me you should do something about it and you should rescue me from this place so she is always trying to deviate claim into this idea of leaving egdon but i have quite given up that idea claim is very very stubborn in this surely i never led you to expect such a thing i own it yet there are thoughts which cannot be kept out of mind and that one was mine must i not have a voice in the matter now i am your wife and sharer of your doom so i do have a say in everything that we are planning because it's our shared life but here we should always think that eustacia always knew that this was one thing klim was not ready to give up that i'm going to open a school in egdon so now she is trying to manipulate him well there are things which are placed beyond the pale of discussion and i thought this was specially so and by mutual agreement claim i'm unhappy at what i hear she said in a low voice and her eyes drooped and she turned away uh, her drooping eyes somehow it makes us remember claim's comments on her eyes 
during the first days of their encounter claim used to ask her why are your eyes so drooping and sad uh, and she said that i'm always sad and then claim wanted to take that sadness away but her eyes are again turning into that drooping state now after this that mystery of guinea is solved thomasin gives the guineas that were um, for claim to uh, them and then disaster strikes in a very different way one morning after a severer strain than usual severer strain means uh, claim used to spend uh, his evenings reading a lot he was preparing himself to be a school uh, master or a school uh, you can say organizer so he used to study a lot he awoke with a strange sensation in his eyes the sun was shining directly upon the window blind and at his first glance did a word a sharp pain obliged him to close his eyelids quickly so he could not look at the bright sun at every new attempt to look about him the same morbid sensibility to light was manifested so his eyes were getting inflamed so he tied a bandage and he went to see a surgeon and then eventually at the surgeon's third visit he learned to his dismay that although he might venture out of doors with shaded eyes in the course of a month so he should wear a sunglass kind of thing all thought of pursuing his work or of reading print of any description would have to be given up for a long time to come so he had to stop reading so he could not prepare himself any more now during this phase uh, one day he was walking out he could barely see much uh, except a few feet in front of him or around him so at that time he came across this village folk whose name was humphrey humphrey expressed his sorrow at clem's condition and added now if yours was low class work like mine you could go on with it just the same what was humphrey's work humphrey was a first cutter it was a very low paying job kind of lowest kind of profession on heath but it did not require much of eyesight you could blindly hold the furs and cut that yes i could said you bright musingly how much do you get for cutting those faggots half a crown a hundred and in these long days i can live very well on the wages so for humphrey it is a satisfactory kind of living that he earns he comes back and speaks to you stacia it arises from my having at last discovered something i can do and get a living at in this time of misfortune so he is saying that he is feeling quite happy now that he has discovered that he can do something to sustain himself yes i'm going to be a furs and turf cutter no clem she said the slight hopefulness previously apparent in her face going off again and leaving her worse than ever this was a nightmare for eustacia you remember the kind of hatred she had for these natives who who had these professions like furs cutting and turf collecting now clem was going to uh, get into this kind of a profession that demanded no intellectual or um mental skill and this was too much for eustacia seeing her husband earning by menial labor but when clem started doing that work that kind of connected him with the heath uh, we see a strange kind of effect it had on him instead of uh, being agitated and frustrated it was as if the heat was supporting him in a way he was getting closer to nature to the professions of the natives and it was as if through these kinds of actions the native in him was truly returning and look at this beautiful expression here the monotony of his occupation soothed him and was in itself a pleasure a forced limitation of effort offered a justification of homely courses to an unambitious man whose conscience would hardly have allowed him to remain in such obscurity 
while his powers were unimpeded. So his powers were restricted but since it was more of a circumstantial thing, he was forced by circumstance, he could go on. Hence, your bride sometimes sang to himself. And when obliged to accompany Humphrey in search of brambles for faggot bonds, he would amuse his companion with sketches of Parisian life and character and so while away the time. So he was having a nice walks with Humphrey, doing his job, singing along and that angered Eustacia that he was enjoying himself. I would starve rather than do it and you can sing. I will go and live with my grandfather again. The honeymoon was now over. Eustacia, so he was working uh, cutting furs and everything, when Eustacia came and stormed upon him and he exclaimed, I did not see you. Do I notice something moving? Why do you speak in such a strange way? It is only a little old song. So I was just singing to pass the time uh, and what's wrong in there? And then he says, it is only a little old song which struck my fancy when I was in Paris and now just applies to my life with you. Again, he is bringing up that trigger word, Paris. Has your love for me all died then because my appearance is no longer that of a fine gentleman? Now that he is doing this job, he is wearing uh, the the work clothes or of, of a first cutter, which are very different from uh, these gentlemen attire. And so he is saying that I don't look like a fine gentleman now in these clothes, so you don't like me anymore? Dearest, you must not question me unpleasantly or it may make me not love you. Do you believe it possible that I would run the risk of doing that? So Clem is trying to be gentle and light with her oh, while she is not ready to, to sing along those uh, lines. Well, you follow out your own ideas and won't give in to mine when I wish you to leave off this shameful labor for Eustacia Labor is shameful. There is a difference between the profession of gentlemen and the profession of the peasants. Is there anything you dislike in me that you act so contrarily to my wishes? Is it like you don't like me and you want to make me angry so you are doing this? I am your wife and why will you not listen? Yes, I am your wife indeed. I know what that tone means. What tone? The tone in which you said, your wife indeed, it meant your wife was luck. So, Klim is uh, saying that, do you think uh, you regret being my wife now? You are my husband. Does not that content you? Not unless you are my wife without regret. I cannot answer you. I remember saying that I should be a serious matter on your hands. So, you don't take me seriously, Klim. That is Eustacia's problem. And then she says... You are too severe upon me, Klim. I won't like your speaking so at all. And eventually, she says this, I fear we are cooling. That means our heat in the relationship, our passion is reducing. And how madly we loved two months ago. And then Klim tries to soothe her somehow. Now, don't you suppose, my inexperienced girl, that I cannot rebel in high Promethean fashion against the gods and fate as well as you? So he's trying to say that, see, I can be a rebellious person. I can rebel against the gods. And why am I turning blind? Why are you doing this to me? But instead, I choose to sing. I choose to be happy. Because I think there is nothing great even in the greatest walks and nothing petty in the pettiest walks. So... I don't mind being a first cutter. That is his whole point. So I sing to pass the time. Have you indeed lost all tenderness for me? That you begrudge me a few cheerful moments? I have still some tenderness left for you. Yes, I do have feelings. Your words have no longer their old flavor. And so love dies with good fortune. So one day I had good fortune. And today I do not have that. So is love going away with it? I cannot listen to this clip. It will end bitterly, she said in a broken voice. I will go home. So there's a, there's a pause in their conversation. 
there is a break in their relationship and somehow this of course leads to a lot of depression in Eustacia Wise life. She tries to win over her depression and in the third chapter we'll see how she chooses to go to uh, a village picnic uh, where people will would gather and dance and sing to take her out of this melancholic state. So she first goes to Klim and talks to him about it. I will not be depressed anymore. I am going from home this afternoon unless you greatly object. So she is trying to get some permission out of him. There is to be a village picnic, a gypsying they call it, at East Egdon and I shall go. To dance? Why not? You can sing. That means if you can sing when you are working, of course I can go and dance somewhere. Well, well, as you will. Must I come to fetch you? If you return soon enough from your work, but do not inconvenience yourself about it. I know the way home and the heath has no terror for me. We know that she is not scared of darkness or even of the heath. And can you cling to Gaiety so eagerly as to walk all the way to a village festival in search of it? So you're going to go that far to just be happy? Now you don't like my going alone? Klim, you're not jealous. So now Eustacia is treading the precarious path. Okay, so she is asking Klim this question that, okay, you don't want me to go alone because you're jealous? No, but I would come with you if it could give you any pleasure, though as things stand, perhaps you have too much of me already. So this is sad. Klim wants to go with her, but then he thinks that this woman is tired of me, sick and tired of seeing me all the time. So maybe she wants to go alone. And he lets her go alone. Still, I somehow wish that you did not want to go. Yes, perhaps I'm jealous. And who could be jealous with more reason than I, a half-blind man, over such a woman as you? Don't think like it. Let me go and don't take all my spirits away. I would rather lose all of my own, my sweet wife. Go and do whatever you like. So Klim has an openness about him. And Eustacia knows she's desperate to just break free from this this house in Alderworth where she is pining away, she is depressed and she actually tries to shake it off by screaming aloud. But I'll shake it off, yes I will shake it off, no one shall know my suffering. And after Klim leaves the house, she is actually talking to herself, I'll be bitterly merry and ironically gay. And I laugh in derision. And I'll begin by going to this dance on the green. So this is a deliberate attempt on her part to rebel, to go against what is expected of her. Because she has seen that following the footsteps of people like Thomasin, only to please the men in her life, has never given her anything. So she wants to do something for herself. What happens in that gypsying dance is well we were kind of expecting this she stood there she watched these couples who were dancing with each other uh, and she was thinking how many of them would get married soon and how many of them would you know break up and then suddenly there was a familiar voice right beside her it was wild eve till this moment he had not met her eye since the morning of his marriage when she had been loitering in the church and had startled him by lifting her veil and coming forward to sign the register as witness. So Eustacia was the one who gave away Thomasin during Thomasin's wedding, which means she signed the register as a witness from the bride's side. But they have not met since then. Before she could speak, he whispered, do you like dancing as much as ever? I think I do. Will you dance with me? It would be a great change for me. But will it not seem strange? What strangers can there be in relations dancing together? Now, well, they are related to each other because Thomasin is a Klim's cousin. Ah, yes, relations. Perhaps none. Still, if you don't like to be seen, pull down your veil. Though there is not much risk of being known by this light, lots of strangers are here. 
She did as he suggested, and the act was a tacit acknowledgement that she accepted his offer. So this is interesting. You see, when she met Klim, she had this disguise of Turkish knight, and now she is having this veil. So what is it with Eustacia and disguises? She is not ready to show her emotions in crucial junctures, and also. Uh, she has these double faces. We cannot understand what is going on in her heart looking at her face all the time. So this recurrent use of veil, of disguise, become a symbol for Eustacia's desire to hold her emotions in her, to somehow misguide people as to what is really happening inside her heart. When they were dancing, they were close to each other. How near was she to Wild Eve? It was terrible to think of. She could feel his breathing and he, of course, could feel hers. How badly she had treated him. Yet, here they were treading one measure. So they were dancing in unison in one measure. The enchantment of the dance surprised her. A clear line of difference divided like a tangible fence. Her experience within this maze of motion from her experience without it. So it is as if there was one Eustacia Y who was living this dance and there was another Eustacia Y who was beyond this dance and she could not connect the two Eustacia Ys. So she was split into two. She had entered the dance from the troubled hours of her late life as one might enter a brilliant chamber after a night walk in a wood. Wild Eve by himself would have been merely an agitation. Wild Eve added to the dance and the moonlight and the secrecy began to be a delight. So it was circumstance. Wild Eve as Wild Eve was not that attractive. But when you put Wild Eve in this concoction of so many things like this moonlight and this situation, then everything turned magical. So when we talk about the return of the native, we do talk about what is called chance and coincidence. So this is chance. This is not something they planned. Wild Eve was there by chance. And this coincidence somehow triggered in her those past memories and made her do things or dream of things which she might not have done if she hadn't been here or met Wild Eve. All right. So this fourth book is all about coincidences and chances and it will be very difficult for us to think that what happens in the story uh, happens because of human actions. We feel as if it is happening because of fate. But that is what we are here to judge, whether it's fate, whether it's chance, whether it's coincidence or whether it's human action that matters at the end. So Valdiv and Eustacia, they have a conversation after their dance and he inquires about Klim's health and he gets to know that Klim has become a first cutter now and his eyesight is getting worse. So as he was walking her down, Towards her house, uh, Clive was walking up with Redleman, and Eustacia said that she should now leave Wild Eve and go back with Clim. Clim, who is almost blind, he cannot see Wild Eve from far, but the Redleman can see the figure of Wild Eve, and he understands that these two have started getting together again. Hardy writes about this here. The moonlight shone directly upon Ven's face as he spoke and revealed all its lines to Eustacia. He was looking suspiciously at her. Redleman, Diggory Ven, was looking suspiciously at Eustacia. That Ven's keen eye had discerned what Yopright's feeble vision had not. Yopright did not see what the Redleman could see. And what did he see? A man in the act of withdrawing from Eustacia's side was within the limits of the probable. So it was highly probable that it was Wild Eve who was accompanying Eustacia so far. So the riddle man, he wanted to make sure of the whole thing. 
and he comes to Thomasin's house, that is Quiet Woman Inn, which is Wildeep's house too. Wildeep was not there, so Thomasin sat in an inner room and heard Ven's voice. She speaks to him. He is not at home yet, Diggory, but I expected him sooner. He has been to East Egdon to buy a horse. East Egdon is where that dance took place. Did he wear a light wide awake? Yes. Now, little man gets it confirmed that then he must have seen wild if because that man was also wearing a light wide awake. Yes. Then I saw him at Throop Corner leading one home, leading one horse home. A beauty with a white face and a mane as black as night. He will soon be here, no doubt. Now, when Ven says this, he means Eustacia, a beauty with a white face and dark hair. But what Thomasin understands is that Wildeep was coming home with a horse which had a white face and black mane. Now, why did Tigari Ven say this at all? You'll understand right now. When Wildeep returned, Thomasin came and said, Where is the horse, Damon? Oh, I have not bought it after all. The man asked too much. So it was very expensive. I didn't buy it. But somebody saw you at Throop Corner, leading it home. A beauty with a white face and a mane as black as night. Ah, who told you that? When, the little man? Now, while you understood that when had seen me and he is actually referring to Eustacia Wild. The expression of Wildeep's face became curiously condensed. That is a mistake. It must have been someone else. He said slowly and testily, for he perceived that Ven's counter moves had begun again. Is it a game of chess then that they are playing? So by the time we reach the fourth chapter, we see that Eustacia and Wildeep, uh, their interest in each other, uh, that has renewed and when Wildeep has interest renewed, he will of course walk across the heath in the middle of the night, which he does. So Eustacia's house is there in Alderworth and Wildeep takes this journey to her house and waits. They had this peculiar signal system. One was he used to drop a stone in the pond. That was one signal system. Eustacia used to call Wildeep by lighting a bonfire. That was another signal system. Another one was where Wildeep would catch a moth and would let it fly into the room where there was a candle and the moth would circle the candle and burn itself. Pretty gory signal. And somehow this is like a symbol where we can see that if somebody is using uh, this as a love signal, then what kind of passion these people have? There is a certain kind of rawness about it, a certain kind of uh, inhumanity, uh, and even disregard of things like human compassion. Eustacia saw the same signal sitting in her room in Alderworth. Eustacia started up. This had been a well-known signal in old times when Wildeep had used to come secretly wooing to Miss Tover. She at once knew that Wildeep was outside, but before she could consider what to do, her husband came in from upstairs. Klim was there. She couldn't do anything about it. Eubright saw that she was colored, flushed uh, because of some agitation. I am warm, said Eustacia. I think I will go into the air. For a few minutes, she wants to go out and talk to Wildeep. Shall I go with you? Oh no, I'm only going to the gate. She arose, but before she had time to get out of the room, a loud rapping began upon the front door. Now she thought, Wildeep wouldn't knock on the door. He would secretly meet me. So who could this be? I'll go, I'll go said Eustacia in an unusually quick tone for her. And then when they finally go and open the door, well, nobody was there. So what had happened? 
Meanwhile, a little drama had been acted outside, which saved Eustacia from all possibility of compromising herself that evening at least. What happened? Whilst Wildeep had been preparing his moth signal, so he was trying to uh, take another moth and throw it in the house or into the room, another person had come behind him up to the gate. This man, of course, Redl man, who carried a gun in his hand, looked on for a moment at the other's operation by the window. Operation means that putting that moth inside the window. Walked up to the house, knocked at the door and then vanished around the corner and over the hedge. So this man carrying a gun had come to the main door, rapped at it and went away. Why? Because then that man thought that if there is this loud rapping, a Klim would come and open the door and then Wildeef would not have the chance to meet Eustacia in secrecy. Okay. In fact, this man even wanted to scare Damon Wildeef so much that he used his gun to make that sound. He could have even shot him like that way. Damn him, said Wildeef. He has been watching me again. Wildeef says, what luck. This Redelman doesn't go away. Anyway, Redelman goes to Mrs. Eubright, tells her everything about Klim's blindness or inflammation of the eyes. And he suggests that you should go and be at their house, meet them, try a reconciliation at least. And then he says, your visits would make Wildy walk straighter than he is inclined to do. So he gives her all the suggestion that she needs to mean that Wildiv is getting interested in Eustacia again. So if you go and meet them, be with them, then maybe uh, Wildiv will not interfere in their marriage. So in chapter 5, we see Mrs. Eubright trying to reach her son's house. The journey across the heath. It was about 11 o'clock on this day that Mrs. Eobright started across the heath towards her son's house to do her best in getting reconciled with him and Eustacia. So she decides to go and meet them. Mrs. Eobright had never been before to her son's house and its exact position was unknown to her. So she walks uh, down that path. Uh, as you have already seen on the map, it's quite a long distance and it's practically across the entire heath. Um, she meets uh, these first cutters and a laborer who points out the direction. Do you see that first cutter, ma'am, going up that footpath yond? Mrs. Eobright strained her eyes and at last said that she did perceive him. So there was a person walking far away. Well, if you follow him, you can make no mistake. He is going to the same place, ma'am. She followed the figure. Now, when she was following this first cutter, walking a little bit distant from her, she suddenly recognized something about the way this man was walking. Suddenly, she was attracted to his individuality by observing peculiarities in his walk. It was a gait she had seen somewhere before. Gait means the style of walking. Okay, so she could identify the, the movements of this man. His walk is exactly as my husband's used to be, she said. And then the thought burst upon her that the first cutter was her son. So that man she was following was none other than Clem. And then she saw that that man went off to enter a cottage, which was the cottage of Klim. On reaching this place, now Mrs. Eobright could have straight away gone there, but she wanted to have some rest because she knew that there she would again meet Eustacia Vai. Maybe they would fight. Maybe they would have tough words thrown at each other. So she wanted to recollect her strength because she was feeling already very exhausted. On reaching this place, Mrs. Eobright felt distressingly agitated, weary and unwell. She ascended, so she got up that slope and sat down under their shade 
to recover herself and to consider how best to break the ground with Eustacia. How to begin talking? Now, she was in an elevated position. It was a small uh, cliff top. From her elevated position, the exhausted woman could perceive the roof of the house below and the garden and the whole enclosure of the little domicile. So, it was a small little house and she could see practically the whole of the backyard and the boundary. And now, at the moment of rising, she saw a second man approaching the gate. Now, when she was about to get up, she suddenly saw that a second man approached the house. His manner was peculiar, hesitating, and not that of a person come on business or by invitation, as if he is like a, like a thief or somebody who is uninvited. He surveyed the house with interest and then walked around and scanned the outer boundary of the garden. She came down the hill to the gate and looked into the hot garden. So that man entered the premises and Mrs. Eubright was very interested. Now we come to the other side or the other part of the same scene. Who was this man? Of course, Wild Eve. Now Wild Eve saw that during the night, Reddle Man was coming at him with a gun. So he could not come and meet Eustacia at night. But he was also a relative. So officially he could come and meet them in the morning, in daylight, as if he was coming to meet uh, his cousin-in-law. While Div, as has been stated, was determined to visit Eustacia boldly by day and on the easy terms of her relation, since the riddle man had spied out and spoiled his walks to her by night. So he comes Eustacia opens the door. Now, Mrs. Eubright, she was not able to see who the man is, but she saw that the man was coming there. Now, from this side of the scene, we are getting a glimpse into the two people talking to each other. That is Wildy and Eustacia. I hope you reached home safely. That is from that dance. Oh, yes. And were you not tired the next day? I feared you might be. I was rather. You need not speak low. Nobody will overhear us. My small servant is gone on an errand to the village. Then Klim is not at home? Yes, he is. Oh, I thought that perhaps you had locked the door because you were alone and were afraid of tramps. No, here is my husband. They had been standing in the entry. Closing the front door and turning the key as before, she threw open the door of the adjoining room and asked him to walk in. So, Wildeve enters. The mother-in-law is outside on that hill. Wildeve entered the room appearing to be empty, but as soon as he had advanced a few steps, he started. He thought there was nobody and then he looked down and on the hearth rug, on the mat, lay Klim asleep. You may go in. You will not disturb him, she said, following behind. My reason for fastening the door is that he may not be intruded upon by any chance comer while lying here if I should be in the garden or upstairs. So she didn't want anybody to disturb Klim and Klim was so exhausted with his work because it involved physical labor that he would sleep. And Eustacia doesn't want it to appear very suspicious when Wildiv is in her house. So she wants Wildiv to act naturally, to speak in a natural voice. Uh, and she does not give any uh, impression that this is an illegitimate visit or a, an illicit affair that she is getting into. So she tries to see things in a normalized way. Oh, why is he sleeping there? Is he sleeping on the floor? Why? He is very weary. He went out at half past four this morning and has been working ever since. He cuts first because it is the only thing he can do that does not put any strain upon his poor eyes. The contrast between the sleeper's appearance and wild gifts at this moment. Now, when Klim was lying down, especially after that exhaustive menial labor, he looked very, very impoverished where Wildy was standing with his, well, he was well-dressed. She continued, Ah, you don't know how different he appeared when I first met him, though it is such a little while ago. 
So Eustacia is so conscious about Klim's appearance and uh, all these external attributes that she is actually feeling ashamed of Klim's changed disposition. But when they have this conversation about their marriage and her marriage being not working out the way she wanted to, she says the marriage is no misfortune in itself. It is simply the accident which has happened since that has been the cause of my ruin. I have certainly got thistles for figs in a worldly sense. But how could I tell what time would bring forth? So she still has some hope for the future. Sometimes, Eustacia, I think it is a judgment upon you. You rightly belong to me, you know, and I had no idea of losing you. No, it was not my fault. Two could not belong to you. And remember that before I was aware, you turned aside to another woman. It was cruel levity in you to do that. I never dreamt of playing such a game on my side till you began it on yours. So, again, blame games between these two. Where while Dave is first trying to say that it's a judgment on your actions. You did not choose me, you chose him. And she says, no, I didn't make any choice. You made the choice before I did and I had to play along. And she has a regard for Klim. It's not that she is unaware of uh, Klim's goodness, she says. Many women would go far for such a husband, but do I desire unreasonably much in wanting what is called life, music, poetry, passion, war, and all the beating and pulsing that are going on in the great arteries of the world? That was the shape of my youthful dream. But I did not get it. Yet I thought I saw the way to it in my glim. She has this desire to reach out to the world, not to limit herself. And that there's this romanticism in her, which kind of gets brutally crushed by reality. And you only married him on that account? There, you mistake me. I married him because I loved him, but I won't say that I didn't love him partly because I thought I saw a promise of that life in him. I loved him, but I also loved him because he represented Paris to me. You have dropped into your old mournful key. Now you have become that depressed old Eustacia again. But I am not going to be depressed. I began a new system by going to that dance, and I mean to stick to it. Klim can sing perily, why should not I? So, if he can sing, I can dance. So, we have adjusted. So, this is not adjustment at all. See, marriage is a union of minds and it's also a union of dreams. So, if in a marriage, two people, they find fulfillment doing things not with each other but without each other. If those moments they spend away from each other are more fulfilling than the moments they spend together, then that marriage is absolutely failing. This is something which we see here. Now, while they are talking, uh, there was a click at the gate. Who made that sound? Of course, Mrs. Yobright. She was coming down to enter the house. She opened the gate. Eustacia went to a window and looked out. Her countenance changed, her expressions changed. She saw that it was Mrs. Eubright. First she became crimson, she became red. And then the red subsided till it even partially left her lips. Why did she become red? Because, well, she was agitated and then she became pale because Wildiv was here. Okay. Shall I go away? said Wildiv, standing up. I hardly know. Who is it? Mrs. Eubright. Oh, what she said to me that day. Now, last time she met her mother-in-law, she talked about Wildiv to her, suggesting that he might have gifted her something. And now if she comes in and catches her with Wildiv, red-handed, she thinks that it would have a very bad impression. So she feels that Wildiv should go. But she cannot say that to him directly because... She's too proud to say that. 
I cannot understand this visit. What does she mean? And she suspects that past time of ours. I am in your hands. If you think she had better not see me here, I'll go into the next room. Well, yes, go. Wildiv at once withdrew. But before he had been half a minute in the adjoining apartment, Eustacia came after him. No, we won't have any of this. If she comes in, she must see you. So see, she is not sure how to deal with this situation. If she comes in, she must see you and think if she likes, there is something wrong. But how can I open the door to her when she dislikes me, wishes to see not me but her son? I won't open the door. She has come for her son. Let the son open. Again, Mrs. O'Bright outside was knocking. Her knocking will in all likelihood awaken him, continued Eustacia. And then he will let her in himself. Ah, listen. Now, somehow, uh, this knocking kind of reminds me of that knocking episode uh, in Macbeth, where Macbeth was saying that I wish Duncan could wake up by that knocking. Here, we see Eustacia wishing Klim to be awakened by this knocking. So, this fear to address the person who is knocking at the gate, that I will not go and meet the man who is knocking, I will not go and meet the person who is knocking, is the fear of the guilty. So, Eustacia is having feelings of guilt in her. Although she has not done anything yet as such. She has not been into any relationship actively yet. But it is a desire to break away from Klim's way of life that is becoming a very important pointer of her possible guilt here. Now, while this was happening, they could hear Klim moving in the other room as if disturbed by the knocking and uttered the word mother. So Eustacia thought that Klim is awake he will go to the door. And Eustacia thinks that Wildiv should leave because she doesn't want any um, complication arising out of this visit. And she says, This is your first visit here. Let it be your last. We have been hot lovers in our time, but it won't do now. Goodbye. Goodbye. I have had all I came for and I am satisfied. What was it? A sight of you. Upon my eternal honor, I came for no more. So there's a kind of knight-like, almost Petrarchan chivalry in uh, Wildiv. He really knows what to say to women, doesn't he? Now, after Wildiv leaves, Eustacia feels that she shouldn't get inside the room because Klim must have opened the door for Mrs. Eobright and maybe... They need some privacy. They like to talk to each other. And maybe later they will call her and then she would go and uh, meet her formally. But she found out that nobody was calling her. So she went back into the house and she wanted to listen to any voice in the parlor or in the drawing room. But hearing none, she opened the door and went in to her astonishment Klim lay precisely as Wildiv and herself had left him, his sleep apparently unbroken. Klim's mother was at this time following a path which lay hidden from Eustacia by a shoulder of the hill. So, somehow, she could not see what happened to Mrs. Eobright. She was walking back. Her eyes were fixed on the ground. Within her two sides were graven. That of Klim's hook and brambles at the door and that of a woman's face at the window. So, from the perspective of Mrs. Yobright, you try to visualize the scene. She saw that her son had entered the house. The equipments for first cutting, those tools and equipments were at the door. So, of course, her son was inside. And then she saw a woman's face in the window. So, of course, they have seen her coming there. And she must have informed him. But they did not open the door. And what would her reaction be? It is too much, Klim. How can he bear to do it? He is at home. And yet he lets her shut the door against me. 
so that's a mother heartbroken walking back from her son's house and then she meets this boy johnny nansach and she speaks as if in a delirium we can understand a lot of dehydration uh, which is very natural in this heat especially in this dry part it's a long way home my child and we shall not get there till evening i shall i'm going to play marbles for supper so johnny's home is nearby so he would go home earlier and then he asks uh, because father comes home does your father come home at 6 to no he never comes nor my son either nor anybody what have made you so down have you seen a ghoster so i was in a ghost or something i have seen what's worse a woman's face looking at me through a window pane and then this boy he notices that this woman is really very very tired your face is white and wet and your head is hanging down alike ah i'm exhausted from inside why do you every time you take a step go like this because i have a burden which is more than i can bear so this was a burden uh, that she was not ready to accept the burden of being turned away by her own son and then johnny says that he'll go back to his mother and then mrs yo bright tells him that when he goes back to his mother he should tell something what shall i tell mother the boy continued tell her you have seen a broken hearted woman cast off by her son now this is also a chance that happens or chance encounter that happens this will have an impact uh, on the later part of the story now mrs yo bright she is walking back taking rest in the intervals now she looks up and she sees this heron this bird arose on the side of the sky and flew on with his face toward the sun he had come dripping wet from some pool in the valleys so she looked at this bird flying up and somehow she felt that her ties to this ground these ties are very difficult to bear and she wants to lift herself she wished that she could arise uncrushed from its surface and fly as if you then so this is very sad the way things are happening here and see i wouldn't call it exactly a coincidence i wouldn't call it fate because this was definitely eustacia's doing what she could have done is she could have made sure that klim gets up she could have made sure that mrs yo bright didn't have to go back but she didn't i'm not blaming her but i'm saying that her actions impulsive as they are are often rooted in so much of selfishness that it is hard to redeem her actions many times chapter 7 the tragic meeting of two old friends refer to the meeting between klim and his mother klim gets up from his sleep he doesn't know about his mother yet and he says that he has had a dream yes it was about my mother i dreamt that i took you to her house to make up differences and when we got there we couldn't get in though she kept on crying to us for help however dreams are dreams so his dreams were very similar to reality except in this case they were getting to mrs yobright's house but could not enter the house so this denial of entry this was very much part of reality and a part of his dream but only the context changed finally in the evening he decides to walk to his mother's place 3 miles on he came to a spot where a soft perfume was wafted across his path and this was the place where his mother rested for some time and then he found that there was a woman's body lying almost unconscious and when he came to that woman and looked at her face he could recognize it as his mother right and that was kind of a shock for him what is it mother are you very ill you are not dying i'm your clip how did you come here what does it all mean well of course the mother couldn't speak he carries the mother in his arms and it's a very heartbreaking sight 
an almost blinded man carrying this burden of a dying mother. He finally takes her down to the place where there are these other heath croppers. Sam is there and he identifies the problem here. She has been stung by an adder. It's a poisonous snake. Yes, said Clem instantly. I remember when I was a child seeing just such a bite. Oh, my poor mother. It was my father who was bit and there's only one way to cure it. Now they're talking about some old Egden remedy. You must rub the place with the fat of other adders and the only way to get that is by frying them. That is what they did for him. So this is a very pagan kind of uh, a remedy and sometimes these remedies they work. Uh, as it was later uh, condoned by the surgeon also. He said that, yes, these kinds of remedies were in practice. But uh, we see that no matter how much they tried, they could not make her survive. Susan now arrived with the frying pan. Susan was the mother of Johnny Nansuch. When the live adder was killed, so they got hold of a live adder, and it was killed and the heads of the three taken off. There were three adders. The remainders being cut into lengths and split open were tossed into the pan which began hissing and crackling over the fire. Soon a reel of clear oil trickled from the carcasses whereupon Klim dipped the corner of his handkerchief and anointed the wound. So Klim tried to treat his mother using these remedies because it was night and they had to wait for the proper medical help which would arrive in the morning. In the 8th chapter, we see that Eustacia is clearly disturbed by everything that has happened. She doesn't yet know that Mrs. Eobright is dead. She goes to her grandfather's place and her grandfather gives her a news. Perhaps you have heard about Mr. Wildeef's fortune? No. Well, he has come into a fortune of 11,000 pounds. Uncle died in Canada. Just after hearing that all his family whom he was sending home had gone to the bottom in the Cassiopeia. So Wildeep has come into everything without in the least expecting it. Eustacia stood motionless a while. How long has he known of this? So when did Wildeep know about this huge sum of money? Well, it was known to him this morning early. So this was the morning or this was the day when this whole thing happened. So when Wildeep had come to Eustacia, he already knew that he had inherited so much money. But he didn't tell Eustacia anything. So that kind of uh, had an effect on Eustacia that, okay, he's such a good man. See, he could have bragged about his money, but he didn't tell anything. Now, he is what I call a lucky man, the grandfather continues. The grandfather is such a callous person. He doesn't have any sense of what to say when and to whom. What a fool you were, Eustacia. In what way? Why in not sticking to him when you had him? Had him indeed. As if I had him. So Eustacia sits down. He actually wanted to go to uh, Klim's house, that is uh, Bloom's End, because Klim had gone out to meet his mother. She was on her way. So she sat down upon a stone and then Wildeef was there. How did you come here? I thought you were at home. I went on to the village after leaving your garden and now I have come back again, that's all. Which way are you walking, may I ask? So she shows the direction of the bloom's end. I'm going to meet my husband. I think I may possibly have to get into trouble whilst you were with me today. How could that be? By not letting in Mrs. Eobright. So see, his mother had come. I was with you. I didn't let, him in, let her in. So now I'll be in trouble. I hope that visit of mine did you no harm. None. It was not your fault. And then she says congratulations to Wildeef because he had come across so much of money. And then he goes on to tell her about his plans. And I will tell you of my plans for the future if you care to hear them. I shall permanently invest 9,000 pounds, keep 1,000 as ready money and with the remaining 1,000 travel for a year or so. Travel? What a bright idea. Where will you go to? From here to Paris. That trigger what again? From here to Paris, where I shall pass the winter and spring. And then I shall go to Italy, Greece, Egypt and Palestine. 
before the hot weather comes on in the summer i shall go to america and then by a plan not yet settled i shall go to australia and round to india by that time i shall have begun to have had enough of it then i shall probably come back to paris again and there i shall stay as long as i can afford to back to paris again you think a good deal of paris she added yes in my opinion it is the central beauty spot of the world and in mine and thomasin will go with you yes if she cares to she may prefer to stay at home so you will be going about and i shall be staying here i suppose you will but we know whose fault that is i'm not blaming you she said quickly they reach clem's house that is bloomsend and inside gradually mrs yobright succumbs to death the doctor there he said that it's not just the adder's bite but also her failing heart because of which she could not survive this and then there was this weeping of women and the doctor says it is all over and then after mrs yobright dies right then almost at the same moment the two watchers that is eustacia and uh, wildeef observed the form of a small old fashioned child entering at the open side of the shed susan nansach whose boy it was went forward to the opening and silently beckoned to him to go back so johnny nansach had entered and he wants to speak to his mother susan i've got something to tell you mother that woman asleep there that is that woman dead there he doesn't know that that woman has died he thinks that the woman is asleep that woman asleep there walked along with me today and she said i was to say that i had seen her and she was a broken hearted woman and cast off by her son and then i came on home a confused sob as from a man was heard within and then eustacia knows that it's clem she needs to get inside the room comfort him but she cannot that's clem i must go to him yet dare i do it no come away so here we have a springtime fantasy tale turning into this darkened doom of autumn the heat has a special way of treating its inhabitants we might feel that what has the heat done to claim to mrs yobright they die they become blind but no that's not the heat's doing that's what life does to them but the heat comes to their rescue sometimes by providing a soothing support sometimes a shade sometimes an adder's bite when life becomes too much to bear so egdon is like a provider and at the same time it will provide you not just with sustenance but also with extinction if you require it at least mrs yo bright could see the face of her son at her deathbed what is in store for you stacia and wild deer who are ruthlessly working against the force of nature what kind of end is there in store for them to know that we will have to read through the fifth book which we will surely do in our next video so till then stay happy stay subscribed this is monali mukherjee signing off bye bye